It is a privilege to be here with you this morning and to open up the scripture. And I hope that as we go on this journey together, that you will be blessed. And I just want to acknowledge as we come together in this place this morning, I don't know you and I don't know your stories and I don't know where you're coming from. And you may be coming into this place this morning and you have some doubts. Maybe there's some lack of faith. Maybe you're just curious about Christianity and you're wondering about who these crazy people are that show up on a Sunday morning at this cute little white church in Port Kells. And so you're here. But wherever you are from, whatever your background, wherever you are in your faith journey, you need to know that you are welcome here. And you are welcome at whatever place you are at. And it's my prayer that as we look at this passage of scripture, that you will catch a glimpse of who God is, that you will catch a glimpse of where you are to be in this story of who we are and why we are even on this earth. And so we begin this morning with the title of this message, which is Home. Where is it? What is it? I love home. I love being home. Everything's great once I get home. When I go traveling anywhere, I can't wait to be home. Just Friday, I was coming back from Penticton, where we had our fellowship annual convention, and I had an incredible woman in my back seat. Um, in fact, I've always thought that I've had the gift of backseat driving in amazing ways. And I'm going to tell you, my friend Lori in the back seat, she was given a double portion. And so she was doing a good job. And she said, do you guys want to stop in Merritt for coffee? And I'm like, you know what? I'm like Bessie the cow and I, home is in sight because I live in Mission. It doesn't feel very far from Merritt somehow. And if you live in Langley or Surrey, you're like, Mission? Did Krista stay overnight at a hotel in Langley to come here today? But anyway, I'm like, no, I'm like, best. I'm going to get home. I just want to get home. And for most of us, home is a safe place. Safe because you have good memories of safe or safe because you have established your own home. And it's the place where you are able to be your authentic self. You can make a mess, put your feet up, and have a bowl of ice cream at 9.30 p.m. With, in a judgment-free zone because it's your home. You know, Dorothy in the classic movie, The Wizard of Oz, put it this way. She said, home, this is my room, and you're all here, and I'm not going to leave here ever, ever again because I love you all, and oh, Auntie M, and you know the next line, there's no place like home. That's kind of how we look at it. And in our passage today, it begins by defining Jesus' geographical location. We are in Jesus' hometown. Home is the place that you are seen, you are heard, you belong. And as one author put it, it's the place of strongest affection and emotional pull. And to set the stage for what we're going to look at and examine in this passage of Scripture, it's really interesting to note that in the previous chapter, Mark chapter 5, we see Jesus perform three astounding miracles. He casts out multiple evil spirits from a man so afflicted and tortured that he has made his home among the tombs near Gerasenes. This public confrontation with evil is so shocking because the demons leave the man and enter a herd of pigs. The pigs suddenly go off the edge of a cliff and drown in the sea. And the audience is offended and they ask Jesus to leave the area and as that's all happening, this previously demonized man begs Jesus to let him come with him. And Jesus says to him in Mark chapter 5, verse 19, Go home to your own people and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And so the man went away and began to tell people in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. Jesus says to him, Go home. And as this part of the story ends, Mark records the account of a woman touching Jesus' garment and receiving healing in her body. And the writer records Jesus saying something very significant that impacts what we will look at in Mark chapter 6. Jesus says to her daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. Go home. And live at peace, he's saying to her. 
And then we see him entering the home of Jairus, the grief-stricken father, and he raises Jairus' 12-year-old daughter from the dead in a home. And all along in this passage, Jesus' disciples are watching powerful miracles that address the Levitical issues of separation from God because of sin, alienation, because of demonic power, an issue of blood that uh, an uncleanness and of course ultimately we see him confronting death in this passage of scripture and jesus offers restoration healing and an opportunity for peace in their respective spheres of influence in their homes and this is the backdrop that sets the stage for what we'll look at in mark chapter 6. and as this passage opens as we've heard in our reading today Jesus is having has made his way back to his hometown. And here Jesus carries on doing what he's already been doing everywhere else that he's been. He makes his way to the synagogue on the Sabbath day and he teaches. And this is where things begin to really unravel for him. I want, you, I want to encourage you this morning to view this passage of scripture through the lens of the disciples. Just think about what the disciples have just witnessed in all these different places that I can't even imagine what it would have been like to see a demonic man released from his demons. Those demons just, you know, do a big hop, skip, and a jump into a herd of pigs and run off a cliff and go into the sea and die. It is, it is Netflix in real time. I mean, it is exciting stuff. Like things have, and he, they've seen a 12-year-old girl get up out of her bed after she'd been pronounced dead. They have seen a woman who had an issue of blood for 12 years come and was healed just by teach, t- touching the hem of Jesus' garment. This is their experience. They are on a high when they arrive in Galilee. And from the front row, they are watching as Jesus overcomes all of these things, evil, disease, and death, and now they are ready for more action. Imagine their disappointment when the people of Galilee begin to question Jesus' authority. Mark records their questions here. Where did this man get these things? What's this wisdom that's been given to him? What are these remarkable miracles that he's performing anyway? And wait a minute, isn't this the carpenter? Well, really, isn't this Mary's son? And isn't that his brother James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Oh, yeah, there's his sisters over there too. What is happening? You see, they were questioning his ability to interpret the scriptures. They were voicing doubt about the source of his power. You see, what they really wanted was to give Jesus a hammer and put him in a vocational box that would render it impossible to take him seriously as a scholar of the scriptures. And the ultimate twisting of the knife came when they dragged his mother and his siblings into the mix. And you see, there was a little bit of uh, there, there was a little bit here of uh, of a reputation that Galilee had, and we hear about this in John chapter one, verse forty six. Or Philip, a newly minted disciple of Jesus, is going to introduce his friend Nathaniel to Jesus. You got to come and meet him. And Nathaniel, you can almost imagine, he wrinkles up his nose and he looks at Philip, and it says there in John chapter one, verse forty six, Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? So this is what Jesus is contending with in this passage of scripture in Mark 6. I remember on one particular weekend when I was away speaking at a retreat uh, many years ago, my children are all grown now and actually my children are all married and I have a, since I was here last, or maybe I, I don't remember if I had a grandchild the last time I was here. Forgive me if I already bragged about him, but he's tremendous. In fact, he's so tremendous I'm now quoting my father who used to look at me when he looked at my children and he'd say, if I'd known how superior your children were, I would have had them first. And I find myself now doing the same thing. This child, this, this eight month old child, he's as high as he is wide. He's in the 99th percentile for height and weight. And I have to actually do a deep breath from my diaphragm before I pick him up for fear of putting out my back. But anyway, Michael is tremendous. So, but when my children were young, my mother would watch them for me on times, sometimes when I'd be away on a weekend speaking and kind of give my, my husband some help. And she was explaining to my youngest son, who was just three at the time, 
don't worry, Marty. Your mom's going to be home. Your mother will be home after two sleeps. Because, you know, weekend retreats, Friday night, Saturday night, you're home Sunday afternoon. And he very innocently, with honest emotion, looked at my mother and said, what mother? In other words, if I wasn't there doing my job, my very existence was to be questioned. And in this recording of the tension that we see in Mark, we see a poignant reminder that in our humanity, we are so prone to overlook what's right in front of us. And we miss the extraordinary when we try to squeeze it through the lens of what we already know, what we can control, and what we can explain. And what we see in this passage, in, there's a hinge that we see in verses 5 and 6 of Mark chapter 6. And it says there of Jesus, he could not do any miracles there except to lay his hand on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed at their lack of faith. He could not do what he'd been doing before he got there because these people in his own hometown lacked faith. When we look back in chapter 5, in each of the instances where Jesus performs miracles, we meet people who were ready to receive from Jesus. This is so key. They were ready to receive from him. And here in chapter 6, when Jesus is confronted with questions meant to discredit him, he responds with a historically accurate pejorative statement. This is what he says to them. He looks at them and he says, A prophet is not without honor except in his own hometown, among his relatives, and in his own home. A prophet is not without honor except in his own town. And I want you to note that it refers to himself in this passage as a prophet. And this was very strategic on his part. You see, they knew that the primary job of a prophet was to speak the truth. All we have to do is look back in the Old Testament. And even if we just pulled out randomly the book of Ezekiel, and we thought we would look at the book of Ezekiel to see what was happening there, almost every chapter opens with the phrase, the word of the Lord came to me. The word of the Lord came to me, and Ezekiel was commissioned to speak the word of the Lord. He was to speak the truth. Nothing stood in the way of a prophet speaking the word given to him by God. And we know this to be true, true because we see the, juxt the juxtaposition of this when we open up the book of Jonah, and we see Jonah trying to actually run away from what God had called him to do. And if you remember that story from Sunday school, Jonah ended up in the belly of a fish because he didn't want to go to Nineveh and preach the truth that God had commissioned him to truth because had asked him to speak because he was the prophet God was sending. Jesus' authority in this passage of scripture is questioned because the audience views him through the lens of overfamiliarity and they don't recognize the authority that or acknowledge the message that he's bringing. Luke gives us a fuller picture as he records uh, that Jesus, in the same instance as, he re as he's reading in the synagogue, he's actually reading from a prophetic passage in Isaiah 61. So imagine they're in the synagogue on the Sabbath. Jesus has opened up the scripture, and they're all sitting around, very similar to how you are here. The synagogues were set up where people sat around the edges, and the, the, uh, the priest would be in the middle, the rabbi would be in the middle of the room reading the scripture. And Jesus read this, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And after the reading of this passage, he looked around at that crowd. And I just want you to imagine that scene with me. He has read this prophetic passage that they are all familiar with. And he looks around at them and he says, today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. I can't imagine that you could have heard a pin drop in that room when he said that. I can't imagine what people were thinking. They were going, is this not the carpenter? Isn't this the little boy who came here with his mother to the, on Sabbath? Isn't 
th- there's there's his brothers, there's his sisters. What is happening? There's a profound declaration in that statement. Jesus is saying, this is who I am. He stands in the middle of the synagogue that he grew up in. He grew up attending and he says to them, I'm the fulfillment of this scripture. You see, the literal translation of the Christ is the anointed one. You remember what this passage says? I've been anointed to proclaim freedom to the captives. When Jesus declares, the Lord has anointed me, he is saying to them, I am the Messiah. I am the one that was prophesied about by Isaiah that should come. And more than an ordinary prophet, he is declaring, I am the Son of God, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the maker of heaven and earth. We read a beautiful passage describing who God is, who Jesus is, Uh, Paul wrote this to the church at Ephesus. And in Ephesians 1, starting in verse 20, and I read it to you from the message, it says this, God raised him from death and set him on a throne in deep heaven, in charge of running the universe, everything from galaxies to governments, no name and no power exempt from his rule, and not just for the time being, but forever. He is in charge of it all, has the final word on everything. At the center of all this, Christ rules his church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which he speaks and acts and by which he fills everything with his presence. This is who Jesus is. This is what he's proclaiming to them in that synagogue on that Sabbath day in his hometown. In our passage here in Mark, this declaration of authority is met with strong negative emotion. Luke describes them as filled with wrath as they drove him from the synagogue with the determination to cast him off of a cliff. And in Matthew 13, as this incident is also recorded there, it is said that the crowds took offense when Jesus proclaimed this truth. And I want you to remember that all of this is happening while Jesus' disciples are in the front row of the synagogue in Jesus' hometown. And this is not what they had signed up for. They have witnessed miracles, and now they are watching Jesus relegated to the mundane, and rejected by those who should have received him with open arms. Jesus boldly declares who he is in this passage of scripture. And Mark records in verses 5 and 6 the outcome of this rejection. It says there, He could not do any of the miracles there except lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. He was amazed. He marveled. Jesus marveled at their lack of faith. I'm sure he was saddened as he watched them turn away. You see, Jesus has defined who he is, and then he turns around, and Mark now has described for us who they were. They were a people who lacked faith. There's a lesson in here that we don't want to miss. You see, when we're confronted with who God is, How do we react? Are we expectant or are we offended? In Mark 5, we see three reactions enveloped in expectancy. We see a man delivered from a demon, and then he begs Jesus to let him come with him. Let me come with you, he says. Jairus comes and says, please come into my home and lay hands on my daughter because I believe that you can bring her back. And the woman with the issue of blood knew that she needed only to touch his garment and she would be healed. You see, what you need to know and what I need to remember this morning is that there is risk involved in expectancy. It's a step of faith to be expectant of what God will do. Expectant or offended? Are you offended by what you cannot explain? You see, the hometown crowd here is annoyed by what they perceive to be a presumption of position and knowledge. And they are offended and they offer no curiosity to Jesus. Their questions are laced with cynicism and doubt. 
You see, your heart posture, my heart posture matters. Regardless of where you are at in your faith journey, how you approach understanding, the curiosity that you bring matters. You see, Jesus never changes. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His ability to do the extraordinary remains constant. But we clearly see in our text here that our faith posture matters. Our expectancy is an invitation to God to be at work. And this is not a blind assumption that my positive attitude will gain me a miracle. Instead, it's my invitation to seek the God of this universe show up and do a work in my life and reveal himself to me. That is what we see happening here in Mark chapter 6. The invitation we have to be expectant. The passage notes that Jesus was astonished at their disbelief. Despite his mission to heal the brokenhearted, liberate the captives, and offer peace and hope for the future, they failed to grasp his purpose, confined by their offense and limited expectations of him. And I contend to you this morning that we all struggle with this. We all struggle with coming with ideas and offenses and boxes that we want to put our faith in in order that we can manage it and manage the outcomes of it. And Jesus says, will you just come expectant. This morning, if we stopped here and I said, that's it for this morning, you got something to think about, we could all go home. Because it's interesting to note how important it is for us to come with expectancy. But the ramifications of this account actually continue as the impact of the reaction of the hometown crowd is seen in the lives of the disciples as Jesus then turns his attention to them and he commissions them in this passage of scripture to go out and go out in pairs and just take what you need. He wanted them to experience what he would do through them after they had witnessed this, this dichotomy, this incredible work that we see at the end of Mark 5 and the offense and his inability to do anything in a crowd that was not expected. And then God said, Jesus says to them, I want you to go out. And I want you to do some things. He says, you are ordinary men and I'm commissioning you for more than you can even imagine. I am going to do great things through you. Are you expecting me to show up? It's as if he's asking them that in this passage of scripture. At the end of this passage, it's starting in verse 7. Jesus calls his disciples to go out two by two in pairs. He gives them authority and a mandate to take just what they need. And these were his instructions. He says, take nothing for the journey except a staff. Don't take bread, no bag, no money in your belts. That does not sound like a really super duper vacation to me. I'll tell you what, I have the privilege of going on a trip this summer with my sister. My sister takes great pride in packing a carry-on. And I'm like, that is just not my idea of a good time. I am going to check luggage with a little bit of extra room in there just in case there's a souvenir that I want to take home with me. I mean, I'll tell you what, I am i don't know if I shared it here with you, but I went to Ethiopia and I... I packed my blow dryer and it blew up there and the Lord had a reason for it doing that, but I packed one and then I blew up somebody else's blow dryer because it, I was like blow dryer cursed on that trip, but I was like packing everything, all the Velcro rollers, five pairs of shoes. I had it all. If Jesus came to me and he said, uh, just take what's on your back and don't take your Starbucks card. Don't take your phone. Uh, nothing. I'd be like, are you sure? Are you sure that's a really good idea? But this is what they were to do. One commentator writes it this way. Jesus sends the disciples out in a manner that requires them to both depend on God for their provision and to receive the hospitality of others. This isn't just about God providing for them. It was about forcing them to make friends with people they didn't know. I think that's profound. You see, in the ancient Near East, it was common and expected for visiting for visiting travelers uh, to be cared for. Not doing so could result in the traveler's death if they lacked provision. 
because there weren't motel sixes there you know there wasn't even you know bus stops where you could like lay on the bench all night they needed the hospitality of others so for the disciples to go out and to be fully aware that they were in need encouraged them to connect with people and share the good news of the gospel then Jesus says to them, no, not only take, don't take any money, don't take, uh, you know, any food with you. He then says, don't pack an extra shirt. This is where I might have gotten off the bus. Just full disclosure here. Not really sure I could go with it. No extra clothing, no nothing. He, Jesus says to them, wear just the sandals on your feet, no extra shirt. And when you enter in a house, stay there. And when and and if you're not welcome there, just carry on leave that place, shake the dust off your feet, and go on. In other words, if they don't want to hear what you've got to say, if they don't want to hear about me, they don't want to hear about the good news that I've come to set them free, do what you can and move on. This is what Jesus has said to them. Now, this instruction, again, was very intentional. I'll tell you why. I didn't know this. This is all a little bit of research. You're going to go, if you go home with nothing else, you're going to go, well, I learned today this really interesting fun fact for the next time I play Bible trivia. Although I don't even know if this question would show up, but this is what it is. It was customary back then to wear two shirts. You wore your tunic and then you wore like an over tunic. And when it came to sleeping, you took the over tunic off and you used it like a blanket. That's why you wore two shirts. So when Jesus says, don't just take the shirt on your back, he's like, don't pack your sleeping bag is what he's saying to them here. Jesus didn't want them to take anything extra so they would find no reason to refuse hospitality or shelter from somebody who needed to hear the good news about who Jesus is. He says, I also want you to note that Jesus, after he told them what not to take and, and commissioned them that way, he said, you are to go out and you are to preach that people are to repent. And this was where we get ready to land the plane here this morning. They went out and they preached and they drove out demons and they anointed many sick people with oil and they healed them. And I want you to note this word preach in this passage of scripture. The word used literally here is that used for a herald's proclamation. The disciples told people what Jesus had told them. It was not their opinion that they brought to the people. It was God's truth that led to the repentance from sin, truth that was received with expectancy. It's interesting. There's an old, an old piece of literature, uh, an old novel that's been around a long time called Quo Vadis. Quo Vadis is the Latin term for where are you going? And maybe over the years, maybe, maybe you remember back before there were daytimers in your phone. Those of us of a certain vintage remember having daytimers that said quo vadis on them and it really it means in latin uh where are you going and this novel talks about a young man by the name of vinicius and vinicius is a young roman and he's fallen in love with a christian girl a little girl that's a christian and because he's not a christian she will have nothing to do with him uh, and so he, but he follows her one night to a secret meeting, a gathering, a little group of Christians that were meeting together. And there was, uh, it was there and he, unknown to anyone that he was in the corner listening and he hears Peter preach, the story goes. And as he listens, something happens to him. He felt, the, the novel talks about how he felt that if he wished to follow that teaching, if he wished to follow the way of Jesus, he would have to place on a burning pile all of his thoughts, habits, and character, his whole nature up until that moment, burn them into ashes, and then fill himself with a life altogether different. An entirely new soul, the story goes. I share with you this morning that that is what repentance is. They were to preach the truth about who Jesus was so that people could repent. The change of repentance, this repentance, is not necessarily from robbery, theft, murder, adultery, and glaring sins, although that falls into the realm of needing to be repented of. But for so many of us, the change may be from a life that is completely selfish, instinctively demanding, totally inconsiderate. The change from a self-centered to a God-centered life. 
It's a change like this that hurts. It is a change like this that can cause offense. It's a change like this that the people in his hometown were not interested in embracing. You see, repentance is no sentimental feeling sorry. Repentance is a revolutionary thing, and that is why so few of us repent. And today, as we've examined this passage, we see a connection between belief and behavior, expectancy and fruition. You see, Jesus is calling all of us out of our meagerness, defined by what we cannot control and understand, and into an abundant life that defies empirical explanation. He is calling us into something that is beyond anything that we can imagine. And the 30-foot view of this passage tells us that home is the place where God's call, God's work, and your expectancy inter- intersects. The worship team is going to come as I close with this thought. And I want you to receive this thought as it's meant, as a challenge to myself, as it is a challenge to you this morning. I really believe this, and this is how one writer puts it. Our churches would be different places if congregations would only remember that they preach more than half the sermon. Our expectancy invites Christ to move among us. There is laid on us a tremendous responsibility that we can either help or hinder the work of Christ. We can open the door wide to him or we can slam it in his face. My challenge to you as we close this morning is simply this. Will you be expectant of what Christ will do in your life? Will you listen and know and understand and discern where he is showing up in your world and not take offense, but lean into what he has for you? You see, all who follow Christ know that home, home, our real home, is the place where Christ is at work.